This is Debbie Potts, and this episode is dedicated to my fellow aging female athletes who might be struggling to change their body composition even when they're doing all the so-called right things, the right fueling program, right training program that used to work for them but is not doing the same thing anymore. Are you experiencing insanity? Let's dive in to what Dr. Stacy Sims is teaching us. Welcome to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Now, here's your host, Debbie Potts. an aging female athlete in their transitional years, also known as perimenopause, menopause, which is one day, and postmenopause. It is much easier to gain weight, lose lean body mass or muscle, to get slower, feel puffy, and just plain old tired every day. Hey, my solution is to stop blaming the aging process and start embracing the aging process. So let's learn how we need to train differently and why, and also learn about nutrient timing, our fuel in and around our workouts to improve the aging process as a female athlete. So let me share some of the information I've learned from Dr. Stacy Sims, since she doesn't come on my show or want to come on my show because it's a low carb athlete. She doesn't suggest low carb for athletes. Let's go into my notes. Hey, just a little note. If you are struggling to get enough protein in per day, which is challenging because if you listen to Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, we need one gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight or at least 100 grams a day, and break that up into 20 to 40 to 50 grams max spread out throughout the day. So if you just eat one meal a day, it's tough. It doesn't really work. If you're doing two meals a day, say trying to get 40, 50 grams of protein in, and then you still might need a little more. So one of my solutions is getting a shake. Try not to do powders. But this is a great option post-workout, as Dr. Stacey Sims says, females need their protein window post-workout is 30 minutes or so versus men can wait up to three hours. So I really like Paleo Valley, the grass-fed whey protein with colostrum, vanilla, or chocolate. I don't know if they have unsweetened. Even better, for unsweetened, you can make your own sweetener as with nut butter. Now, it's made from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished cows. It has 13 grams of protein per serving, so you'll need about two scoops in there. And the vanilla the ingredients are organic coconut milk, organic vanilla flavor, maltodextrin from organic tapioca root, Himalayan pink salt, monk fruit, organic fiber, Ceylon cinnamon, and does canal contain milk? So if you can't do whey, you might want to look at getting their bone broth protein. And that is usually good for clients that I coach that can't do whey when we identify their food sensitivities in their functional lab test assessment. Now there's also colostrum, which is milk as well. So if you can't do dairy, go for the bean or beef protein powder or bone broth protein. Now, their chocolate is another option with organic cacao beans. So you always want to read the ingredients and products before you buy them. And that's why I like Paleo Valley because they are really 
good at choosing clean ingredients. And the founder, co-founder, Autumn Smith is amazing. And she is a holistic nutritionist herself. So she does really take pride in getting quality ingredients. So check out their amino acid profile on their whey and colostrum powder. You'll get all the nine essential amino acids that we need. And if you listen to some of my podcasts and blogs, we do need that essential amino acids and get that leucine in your amino acid profile post-workout that has a 2.53 grams of protein amino acid. So check it out and use our code low carb athlete for a discount. So let me know what you think and what your favorite recipes are to use your protein powder in a shake. Talk soon. All right. I'm going to give you a lot of notes here that I put together in my blog. So go to debbiepotts.net backslash fueling training adjustments for the aging female athlete. Now I've been doing Dr. Stacy Sims course menopause 2.0 for some time now because I keep rewatching everything. It is challenging for me to get some of the changes of endurance athlete who's done low, long distance or low heart rate, long distance training for a long time. I started doing Ironmans in 2001 until 2013 when I got adrenal exhaustion and stopped trying so hard in 2015. Now I've done the math method, max aerobic function heart rate by Phil Maffetone. I did new leaf metabolic testing for two years, and now I'm starting to do Pinoy metabolic testing here in North San Diego. Now, what ideally we all do is get a metabolic test, as I've talked about on previous episodes, and stop guessing on your training in zone two and what is zone two for you and your interval training zone five and zone four and tempo training be zone three. And you can listen to my podcast with Daniel Crumback to learn more about zoning and what type of HIIT training is good for you what those heart rates are, what is your zone one for recovery. And then sit training is sprint interval training, which would be top of zone five. Now, how much the female athlete should do versus men of long distance stuff is we are endurance athletes primarily here. Maybe you're not, but I have always done the long, slow stuff, keeping my heart rate, the 180 minus your age or whatever my zone two is. Maffetone is max aerobic function, as I said, 180 minus your age plus minus five beats or get tested. So you're not just using math formula. That's ideal. What I've done in the past worked very well. I did Ironmans, as I said, long time. And I started qualifying pretty soon after I started Ironmans in 2001, I started qualifying for Hawaii Ironman 2003 by doing this long, slow distance, being fat adapted, doing speed work once a week. I was doing the low carb stuff starting back in 2005, 2010, more so 2009 is when I started paying attention to more fasted workouts and doing the bulletproof coffee and all that. So I've been in metabolic efficiency world for a long time and fat adapted. Now, as I have experienced the last few years after I turned 50, my body composition is not, it's, it's more work and my body. I've always had a hard time losing weight. It just doesn't happen easily for me. I think that's part genetics. If I look at my report, which I love, you should look at, if you want genetics, the DNA company is the best reports ever I've looked at. And again, low carb athlete for your discount code. Now, I know all the long, slow distance stuff I like to do is a retired triathlete, swimming, biking, running, doesn't help me lose weight, fat weight. I'm not getting stronger as I wish for all the work I've been doing. I haven't gotten faster and running has been my area of opportunity for the last eight years. I said previous episodes, I have been a fast, strong runner ever since my adrenal exhaustion 
is why I do coaching now for people to help them avoid going through what I went through. I used to do a 312 marathon was Boston. 317 was my second best time in Boston. Ironman, I would do a 340 something split in the run. Uh, and I, I would say, I only say that because I can't even run speed work <laughs> to like nine minute mile pace. My body is not the same. Mitochondria dysfunction, adrenal exhaustion, metabolic chaos. I don't know what it is, but I do know what Dr. Stacey Sims has taught me is really opening my eyes, changing how I train and how I've been training other clients. But I like doing the long distance workouts. I have changed since I don't get my work schedule post COVID, not owning my fitness studio after 10 years, being in fitness for 25 years, I would always have a break 1.30 to 3.30 and go for a bike ride. I'd go master swimming and, and ride. So I've done long, slow, different distance training forever. And I now, since I moved to Seattle, from Seattle to San Diego, my workout schedule is bike or run in the morning and then swim at lunchtime. I don't have the opportunity to do two hour bike rides year round because it's dark in the morning in the winter. So I'm been trying to take this information I'm getting that minimal effective dose to create the most positive response. What I want from my workout to get stronger, to get faster, to get more power. And that is what we female athletes lose. And I think men too, I'm sure everyone kind of struggles with the changes, but we can't, I, I always say, I hate the excuse saying I'm getting older. This is what's going to happen. And I've said for years, I don't accept that excuse because I've heard it from clients for so long. Oh, I'm older. I can't do this. I can't do that. Like, no, you just need to train differently and add in certain parts of your workout that you might have not done before. And as I say, every episode, the definition of insanity would be in this example, doing the same program, the same training schedule month after month after month, year after year, that you're not changing what you're doing and if you're not getting the results that you want, well, let's stop, pause and reset and do a new training program, a new fueling program, nutrient timing, and maybe adjust your fasting window. So you're eating more because we'll get into over a few episodes. We're not often eating enough calories and getting our protein goals. So we're low energy availability. I've talked about that a lot. LEA. Okay, so here's a question I asked Dr. Stacey Sims, and she responded to me a couple times, and I, I wanted to know more because I always ask the why. All right, we have to do different type of workouts to get our body composition to change, and we need to change how we eat and how we exercise so we can improve lipid, which is fat, removal from our cells, and how to use stored body fat for fuel. So it's very different from what I've been trained and I, I understand it. So I, I wrote it all out and I copied her response here that I'll go over and I have to continue going over it because I'm having to rewire my brain <laughs> for what happens when our estrogen and progesterone gets lower for us that are, you know, over 40. Now, I always think that part of my changes with adrenal exhaustion, I was 41 years old, that we're not just adrenal exhaustion with low cortisol and that domino effect to all your hormones and metabolic chaos, which is going to be, you know, impacting your gut and everything else. So who knows? Anyways, I'll stop blabbing. Now, the question I ask, Women put on body fat because we have a decrease, a decrease in the amount our body removes with regards of how we use fat. So the lipid ch removal changes she talks about is how we use fat changes and how we store fat. So the lipid is fat, fat removal, fat usage. Now there isn't any change in the amount being stored, she says. So looking at, okay, how does that mean? We're not changing the amount of being stored of fat. So it's an important factor that gets neglected and blamed on women. Stacey Sim says in our program that we're not doing enough to prevent that body fat accumulation that is creating this decrease or the signaling for using fat 
but it's an increase or rather no change in the tissues. So why, why do we put on body fat? We're not sitting on the sofa as athletes being lazy. I'm working out morning, lunchtime, swim, go for a walk at nighttime, do my sauna. But why do I keep gaining weight and I'm not doing anything different? I mean, that's what happened after adrenal fatigue. I went from top, I was 11th in my age group in Ironman Hawaii. A few months later, I had no energy. I was fatigued. I couldn't do anything. I had to have naps in the afternoon instead of a workout. And I was, couldn't sleep at nighttime, all the red flags of adrenal issues. And then my body changed. I gained literally 30 pounds and lost muscle. And I just was, I felt like a fat blob and I didn't change anything before I started gaining weight, before I got the fatigue, but I didn't change anything. I just wonder part of that is our hormones and we're not eating enough. So if we're not using stored body fat, that seems to be accumulating as in for me, my thighs and my butt and when we are exercising. So if we're not using the stored body fat, it's accumulating. How am I supposed to get this fat that's on my body? How do I use it? Because we used to just do fasted exercise and do long, slow distance, keeping our heart rate where we're burning the most fat that we identify in our metabolic testing assessments, right? So I know I'm burning tons of fat and fat ox rates are high. I am keeping my fuel steady, not spiking glucose. I'm not activating insulin, but hmm. How come I'm not losing any weight? What the heck is going on? So if we have endurance athlete, we have this decrease in the stimulus to build muscle. So we lift weights. We're doing endurance training. I'm not supposed to do zone two anymore. I'm not supposed to do fasted workouts. How am I getting that fat to be used on my body? Hmm. So here's what Stacy says. Dr. Sims. Hey, Debbie, there's a few things going on here at rest and in sedentary women. The default is to have a slight increase in storage with less overall use as fat as a fuel. So default is to have a slight increase in fat storage with less overall use of fat as fuel. That's our default. When we are exercising as active women, we do not prefer preferentially use fat from any one area in our body. Well, I know that, but we do use fat for fuel. What we do not need to do is add to the signaling to our body to increase fat storage. The signal to tell our body to increase fat storage is what moderate intensity does as us aging athletes, females are going through. Moderate intensity exercise leads to higher cortisol and fasted low intensity exercise also gives the body the signal to increase fat storage. This is what Dr. Stacey Sims is telling me. We also do not need to do zone three, zone two training. So her moderate intensity, I would think that's zone three. When I do Pinoy metabolic testing, we use five zones. So again, we also do not need to do zone two training. Our bodies by design are already capable of maximizing a mitochondrial oxidative resiliency, increasing mitochondria density and maximal fatty acid, fatty acid oxidation. We have more proteins and complexes in the mitochondria than men for all of these mechanisms. So by design, by females at birth, we already have this ability to do zone two training. This is also why women are more metabolically flexible. So do you get that? We do not need to do zone training. Our bodies by design are already capable of maximizing mitochondria resiliency, mitochondria density, and maximal fatty oxidation, fatty acid oxidation. 
if we are more metabolically flexible, we can test this in Pinoy metabolic testing. So she talks about that we, female athletes, middle age, when we look at having 30 grams or so of carbs per hour of exercise, this is to maintain blood glucose levels so the feedback to the liver is to keep the mitochondria working. So this is where, as a low-carb athlete, for um, what year is it? 2023, since about 2005-ish, I've been playing with low-carb. And I've done well, but I'm not anymore. So if you're like me and not doing any fuel in and around your workouts, this might be something to look at. She talks about having 30 grams of carbs per hour to maintain blood glucose levels. So there's a feedback to the liver to keep the mitochondria level. With low blood glucose, there's an inhibition of gluconeogenesis. That's where we make glucose. So we have an inhibition of gluco making new glucose. And it's a signal to down-regulate mitochondria function. So, fascinating, huh? This is maintaining, this is just so confusing, right? So you go, okay, this is what worked for me before, but I, I'm not losing any weight. What's going on? But this is why I do what I do now as a health, holistic health fitness coach for athletes is that we need to personalize the fueling and training program. Also investigate additional sources of chronic stress externally and these hidden sources of internal stress that will contribute to what we call as health investigators at FDN practitioners, metabolic chaos. So I would want to look at how is your liver function as well as what's your insulin and look at gut markers. All right. So Dr. Stacey Sims says with low blood glucose, there's inhibition of gluconeogenesis, gluco neogenesis, making new glucose, right? From fat and protein. There's a signal to down regulate mitochondria function. I know I already said this, but I have to repeat it. So the shift to do more sprint interval training, SIT, and high intensity interval training hit with resistance training is to have a more systemic effect on blood glucose homeostasis. And this increases the crosstalk between exerkines. It increases the crosstalk via exerkines between the skeletal muscle and the visceral fat where the exerkines downregulate visceral fat storage. So we need to shift from doing long, slow distance training volume high training of volume each week and shift our mindset, understanding these changes in our metabolism to doing more combination of sit and hit training with the resistance training. And I'll give you some examples later. We want to have our visceral fat, that stored fat, not down-regulated, we want to up-regulate them, right? We want to get rid of the stored fat. We want to tell our body it's okay. So Stacy says, if the primary fat storage is the hip thigh region, that was my question, we can mobilize this through use of caffeine, which S Fuels has a great option for that. Having it before exercise releases more free fatty acids that can be oxidized. But if it is not, then it is re-assimilated into adipose tissue. Hmm. Well, so we can mobilize our fat storage. Having caffeine before exercise releases f- more free fatty acids. Hmm. What do you think? The higher protein intake is always recommended. 
Protein is a powerful agent to increase fat loss across all regions of the body and promote lean mass and maintenance. I know I've been prioritizing protein. I made some chick, uh, what I have these beef sausages for breakfast and I had three of them. I'm eating, I'm tall and I, I've got muscle and I can eat a lot <laughs> and I eat protein and I'm eating till fullness, making sure I take my digest enzymes first because I don't digest food properly. So I need to take my enzymes before I eat. When I remember it makes a big difference or else that food just sits in my stomach for hours. My stomach organ doesn't move south through the small intestine. So protein for me fills me up. I do best with a higher protein with fat. So I just have not been having the carbohydrates because I haven't really felt like them, but there are some carbs I do add in. I, I did have these seeded gluten-free crackers with butter on them with my sausage this morning and some cheese, but I'm 20 to 30 grams is what I was trying to find. What does that look like for someone that I don't eat gluten, wheat products? You know, I'm not going to have certain foods before I exercise. Could I do this liquid? So I was looking at S fuels, go longer.com. And you can listen to my previous podcast with Leighton and Stacy Sims, of course, is not proponent of low carb, but I do like the fuel that S fuels does have available called race plus. So if we could use this gel, that might be a good option. That's nice and clean for doing high intensity workouts that we'll talk about and have a fuel source that doesn't give you the gut distress. So they have a race drink, but the race plus gel you could do, that would give you some options. And they also have a protein bar, which if you can't do milk is way, can't do dairy. It's not a good option, but that is a pre-workout and or post-workout bar that might be a good option. And then I'm trying to find some other options for people too. So it's going to give you some carbohydrates. There's also Keon bars, another option, but what you could do pre-workout, this has 15 grams of quality protein, efficient fat oxidation helps with recovery. But what about the carbohydrates in it is what you have to look at. Does it have enough carbohydrates to give you that pre-workout I use Laird superfood bar because Neil works for Laird. And so that's a good option. I like it has some mushroom adaptogens in it. So there's some protein and carbs in there. So experimenting what works for you, but looking at, do I need to experiment before my hit training workout when I'm doing some speed work, having some carbs, pre-workout might be helpful because Stacey Sims says when we have 20, maybe 20, 30 grams of carb per hour, this maintains our blood glucose levels. So we're telling the liver to keep the mitochondria working. So I need some carbohydrates to tell my body to break down fat for fuel and to upregulate mitochondria function. Because she says with low blood glucose, There's an inhibition of gluconeogenesis. So I'm not making glucose from fat and it's signaling to downregulate mitochondria function. So if I keep my blood glucose more stable by having in some carbs each hour or just pre short hit hit intensity, high intensity training, maybe I will be able to use more fat as fuel. So I don't want, I want to upregulate mitochondria function. So she's saying having some carbs each hour of a long workout or beforehand. So let's go through some notes. Now, body composition changes for the aging female athlete. We need to hear about HIIT training. That would be 10 to 60 seconds all out, hard as you can go. So if you look at my Pinoy podcast I've done, you're doing zone four, 
which is say one to four minutes. Hit training is not over five minutes long and you're recovering say 30 to 90 seconds. Resistance training is doing one to six repetitions, three to five sets, doing that two to four times a week. You're prioritizing your protein, which is 30, 50 grams per meal. As I said in the intro, it's, I like listening to Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. It just keeps it simple, but more hundred grams or more per day protein for females. But she looks at a little higher level, ideal body weight in grams of protein. So if you want to weigh 125 pounds, that is your goal for protein consumption for the entire day. And you break that up into 20, 30, 50 grams per meal of quality, clean animal-based protein, ideally. So then we have strategic carbs. I call it more nature's carbs, not processed packaged foods around exercise to help shuttle glucose into the cell before fuel, before you work out, before you do a HIT training session. So studies show that less volume, but higher intensity is needed for us female athletes to create changes in her body composition and aerobic fitness for menopausal female. Our total fat mass is changed, decreased. Our lean body mass has increased and muscle mass has increased when the research studies showed HIIT training with the resistance training, the combination of it, HIIT training alone would help with body composition, but the lean mass increases with the resistance training. So the resistance training increases percentage of your muscle mass or lean body mass. HIIT training changed abdominal fat mass in this study, but not increase your lean body mass. So we want to combine the resistance training to moderately change our body composition with the right kind of HIIT, which means to me zone four, hard as you can, all the way down to zone one, get your zone one, right time, so you're ready to go hard again. Sit training we'll talk about is a short intensity sprint interval training, and that would be zero, she says, but I say like one, 10 seconds to 30 seconds all out. That's super high, intense, balls to the wall, go hard as you can, recover a long time, go again. So you can do this in between a strength workout. For example, I did this morning, I picked a strength workout and then hit workout, which took me a long time to get my heart rate up. So it wasn't truly a hit training because I only got to 130, 140 heart rate, which was okay because it's Monday and I was trying to do recovery, active day, not do this. Today wasn't my goal, but I was experimenting rope slams and then I did, what did I do? I did rope slams and combined that with, um, say pushups. I don't remember what I did this morning. And then I did bench hop overs with a cable row with a deadlift and row. And then I did a lap pull machine with, uh, oh, squat jumps. I did squat hops for 30 seconds to a minute. So I combine that in the HIIT training with my strength resistance training workout. Now, what's interesting, I must say, when I was turning, the year I was turning 50, I created a workout I wanted to be able to do on my 50th birthday. It was 50 of everything. So it was say five pull-ups 10 times, or I did BOSU burpees and I did the ball slams. And I did, I had in there, uh, the tire flipping, that's the machine thing to flip it back and forth. I was doing all this interval training and I actually remembered I finally lost weight for my birthday party and I felt pretty good. I was at a good weight that I felt comfortable. I felt lean and strong and fit. And I hadn't felt like that for a while, but I just realized this year going, Oh, I stopped doing all those hit training because I hurt my low back doing box jumps and my left side's all wanky why I can't run very well because my left side's not firing. And so I identified that limiter when I was doing my 50th birthday workout. But the point is I did all this heavy weight lifting because I've been doing heavy weights for a while, but I wasn't doing, I stopped doing the, the hit training type of stuff, sit training after my birthday, because of my last year, I've been focused on getting this left side working to go with my right side, but it's still not cooperating. 
Anyways, I noticed my body composition has changed and I stopped doing these sit training. So I've been trying to add that back in at the gym. And then also when we go for a bike ride this past season, summer, I started adding in speed work on my bike when it's a gradual hill or big hill. So we have this loop that's like not even our bike ride, but it's going up a hill. Then we come down the hill. So you have recovery. So in that hill period, I would do pickups and get my heart rate up to 160s, 170 is my highest recovery a little bit and then go again. So it'd be more the hit training and then there's downhill and then I'd go back up another hill and there's kind of hill, you know, little rolling hill a little bit so I can do 20 seconds and then recover. And so, and then there's another hill to go back home. Then our street is a hill because our house is on a hill. So anyways, point is if you can find, say you're doing your bike ride for an hour or you're doing a 45 minute run, warm up, cool down in that middle section. When you're doing hit training, it should just only be 20 minutes. Dr. Stacy Sims says, which makes sense because when I'm doing 20, 30 second sprints or one minute intervals, you shouldn't be able to do more than 10 of them because you're not going hard enough if you're able to do more than that. So you want to look at quality first, not quantity, and then make sure you have enough recovery. Okay. So then I wanted to touch in the studies. I just talked about lipid changeover. So we want to combine resistance training to change our body composition with hit. So strength, heavy weights is the three to six reps. I can't do another rep type of weight with good form and then add in your interval trainings. Or as I said, within your run or bike ride or swimming masters, we do that automatically. We did a lot of 10 by fifties today in swimming. And then we did um, 100 meters and 75. So that's a good way to add in some intervals when you're working with people in your lane. So we've got that, but we also had, make sure you're tracking your recovery. So you can go two hard days and easy, easy day. And then maybe go hard, but back to back hard days sometimes is beneficial. Another talk. Okay. So lipid turnover as we age. What is happening to our body, how it uses and stores fat with changes in the body fat. So just go into this lipid turnover a little bit more as I learned. So as we age, females, listen in. It's not about using more fat and burning fat, right? So we have to change our mindset. It's not about using more fat for fuel and burning more fat. It's which Stacy Sims is trying to get across. And this is why I keep having to, it's, I don't know why it's so hard for my brain to change this, understand this and how I need to change. But I like to know the why so fascinating, how our body changes, how hormones impact our performance and what changes when we lose estrogen and progesterone as we get older, it is about changing the rate of fat used by the tissue lipid or fats are used by the body and we want to increase the use of fat by the body. We get dysregulation in the muscle cell as what happens when we're losing our hormones. We can't pull glucose into the cell as well. We also get more inflammation. Why she says we feel more puffy and oxidative stress. Why we probably need some glutathione. We have more stress, oxidative stress to our cells. We want to signal, we have signals to increase lipid uptake into the muscle and adipose tissue. So that means increase fat uptake into the muscle, into the fat tissue as a storage factor for, we have an increased need for fat fuel. So our body says, Hey, we're going to put this fat over here aside, store it in our fat tissue. So we're going to store it for later because we have increased need for fat. So we want to, the signal is increased to get fat into the muscle and stored into the adipose fat tissue. So next the, to get results, we need to add in the hit and the sit training. They're short, sharp, and low volume. As I said, five minutes or less and total time, as I said, is 20 minutes, no more than that, because you're not doing high intensity If you're able to keep going, 
that's not the high intensity. You should be tired 20 minutes and get, need to just warm down. So you want to create that stress as hit and sit training there. Remember hormesis, hormetic stressors, short burst, all out, sprint interval training, hit training to create that stress. And we get stronger, we adapt to it and get stronger, right? So that's what strength training is. It's an adaptive process. We get stronger in the recovery period in between workout sessions. So we want to make sure we get the right dose of stress that we can recover and repair and adapt and get stronger. So HIT training is 80% or more of your max heart rate, longer intervals, one to four minutes or 30 seconds or more, five minutes maximum with the variable rest. So you can listen to my Pinoy podcast with Daniel Crumbach that I have two episodes with and I've talked about heart zoning on my YouTube channel. You can check that out. Sit training, is it sprint interval training? Is that, as I said, 10, 30 seconds or all out sprint intervals, zone five, like top high as you can go, VO2 max. So the HIT training, the benefits Stacy Sims teaches us, and you can listen to her on many interviews on podcasts, metabolic control and cardiovascular fitness. We need the glucose to keep the muscle contraction going. And the longer stimulus changes the blood vessel. And we also get metabolic homeostasis, the need for a certain amount of glucose we need to keep it going, to keep that right homeostasis, that balance, Goldilocks effect. So one or more minute of hard work, we need the glucose to fuel the activity. So we teach the body to pull the glucose into the muscle cell and... In result, we become more sensitive to glucose and insulin at rest. So if you don't know, when we are pre, peri, postmenopausal, we're more insulin resistant or insulin insensitive. So that's why Dr. Mindy Pels talks a lot about fasting and helping you become more insulin sensitive with fasting, but we can also do that as athletes and exercise and draw the glucose from the bloodstream into the muscle. And that's why we want to do more strength training. So we have larger storage tanks, larger suitcases, as Dr. Gabrielle talks about, that we have more place to deposit that glucose. And then we don't spike up the glucose up and down as much. We're doing that through exercise, getting it rid of the, getting it balanced at homeostasis level. So metabolic homeostasis. All right, sit training. Sprint interval training, what it does, it induces epigenetic changes in the muscle cell itself and improves fast twitch muscle fibers. We've been doing a lot of low, slow distance, so that's the slow twitch muscle fibers, and the top end metabolic anaerobic capacity. So this has given us that high end to be right around that VO2 max, that peak aerobic consumption. And our ability to pull in more glucose into the cell, again, without using insulin, makes the muscle more efficient and effective. So we get more mitochondria activation with aerobic metabolism is going to kick in with one minute or longer. So even with HIIT training, you're getting some improved aerobic metabolism benefits, mitochondria improvements. And improves the response and reduction in oxidative stress. So we get some benefits with sit training with antioxidation. Also some benefits from the inflammatory response. So we get acute inflammatory response working at this high intensity, the sit training, and we can get stronger from that. Just remember that Goldilocks effect for everything. So sprint interval training, hit training, both of them 20 minutes max, or less. Intervals are not more than five minutes and your recovery is down to your zone one. So whoops, what we want to look at is that epigenetic changes, I think is a big part in our metabolic control, homeostasis of our glucose. So really important stuff. So we want to add in HIT training, but you have to be rested, which is why I prioritize sleep and I don't make a lot of social plans during the week, but what can we do to add this in within our workouts and redesign our workouts to be 
more effective to create that positive response that we're looking for with our body composition. For me, it's body composition, speed, power, and strength. So what can you do? So remember, Dr. Stacy Sims has lots of information on her blogs, but remember going back what she told me in my email today, we do not need to do zone two training. Our bodies as females are by design already capable of maximizing mitochondria, oxidative resiliency, increasing mitochondria density, maximal fatty oxidation, fatty acid. So we have more proteins and complexes in the mitochondria than men for all these mechanisms. We're more metabolically flexible. So we need to remember that we want to use, we do use fat as fuel, but at rest and in sedentary women, our default is to have a slight increase in storage of fat with less overall use of fat as fuel. So if we're not using as much fat for fuel, we want to signal the body to increase fat use, right? We don't want to do signaling fat storage from moderate intensity, increasing cortisol, and we don't want to signal storage with fasted, low intensity workouts that we have all been doing, zone two fasted morning workouts. I have been adding butter in my coffee after Dr. Elizabeth Bright talks about adding healthy fats more throughout our day, not eating big bolus one meal with tons of fat. So what do you think? Are you looking at changing how you're training? We want to mobilize fat for fuel, but we're, we need to figure out how to send the signals. So that would be doing the HIT training, getting rid of the high volume workouts during the week. Maybe just do a long bike ride, long run if you're doing a triathlon schedule as I still tend to do. If we do more our long stuff on the weekend, would it be okay to add some intervals at the finish, the last hour? I live up on a hill, as I said, so typically going home on our bike rides, it's we have like three big hills to go up. That's another thought. So would that work? Less of this long, slow stuff. More HIIT training. My weekday workouts are now about intervals. And then if I get tired, my, my scores, I don't feel it. Everything's kind of down. Usually I can listen to my body. I don't need my aura ring to tell me I'm tired. It's already kind of obvious <laughs> when I can't do anything. Then it might be just a beach walk or a hike on flat level. Maybe you need to alter your fueling in and around that workout, looking for that 10 to 30 grams of carbohydrates pre-workout if you're going longer. And maybe we need to think of some, what, what does that look like? What is a good idea? Berries and heavy cream and maybe some gluten-free granola. Maybe it's S fuels. They do have this really good product I like called, um, their granola and you can make it yourself, like add some fat. So if you look up, where is it? Their shop now page life bars, they have their granola somewhere in here, but that is something to look at their life products. Laird superfoods is non dairy and they have the mushroom adaptogens. As I said, that's good. Oh, S fuels. Keto three is a vanilla cinnamon, low carb, high energy breakfast cereal that you can make it as a breakfast, post-workout, or a snack, but it's pretty cool. You can add, say, butter, coconut oil to it or whatever fat, but it has just two grams of sugar, but you could add more carbs. It does have some protein, whey protein, and glutamine in it, some fiber, but you could add berries for your carbohydrates and try that. So anyways... I want to finish this lipid turnover. That's what we're trying to improve. So the hit training and sit training to help our body change, drawing 
glucose into our cells, sending the signals. That's what we're trying to find, metabolic flexible. So HIIT training, some of the benefits. Metabolic homeostasis, as I said, you're getting your body to understand that certain amount of glucose is needed to keep the muscle contraction going. We improve the pathways to the skeletal muscle, the mitochondria adaptation to the more mitochondria in the muscles. So that's another win. It improves microvascular blood flow. So we get the micro vessels help get more improvement in these little tiny blood vessels. It increases blood flow within the muscle. So we have better control blood flow stimulate small capillaries to grow and improve blood flow into the muscle during the strong stress of HIIT training. She also talks about transporting available carb glucose within the cell. We talked about antioxidation upregulation of oxidative response. So we have better response to the reactive oxidative species, right? Look that up too, to go into that for you. What is ROS? You hear about that. Greater growth hormone response and natural increase of natural testosterone. So you get an increase in testosterone and growth hormone. You get a decrease in estrogen and counters cortisol. Estrogen is not needed, so it can be used in other places. So we already have a little bit, little bit of estrogen still around, but you can use it for other places and not need it for your workout as a stimulus. So HIIT training is a strong stimulus to decrease abdominal fat. So remember going back to the studies of HIIT training helps change body composition and create positive change with body weight. That's why we want to do HIIT training, but we also need the resistance training. So the more changes in the body comp, lower fat, increased lean tissue is the combo. Remember HIIT and resistance training. And resistance training, remember, is three to six reps of heavy weights if you've been training for a while. Built that foundation first. All right, other benefits, increased, improved blood vessel function. So you improve the blood flow into the muscle. I talk about that and cardiovascular health. And we can have more mitochondria in the muscle with HIIT training as we go through this midlife transition of our hormones going downhill. We want to embrace aging process and change how we train, right? So hit training, sit training a few days a week, not all this long, slow distance stuff that we've done for years doesn't work anymore. So oxidative metabolism, that's increasing lipid, your fat uptake. So we're not storing fat, but we're using fat, more muscle into more fat into the muscle we use as fuel helps. We want to change that. We want to improve our use of fat. So this is going back to this whole topic today, lipid uptake. So we want to increase in lipid uptake that is not being stored, but we want to use it. The uptake in muscle cell, but we're using more fat. Upregulation to oxidative response, more carbohydrate glucose into the muscle. Oxidative metabolism is increasing that fat fuel into the muscle to be used, not stored. Saying that again, we want to get the fat into the muscle to be used, not store fat. And we want to change that body composition. So adding the sit and hit training within a workout, that's 20 minutes of an intervals, add on the warm up, 10, 15 minutes, you're warm down. That is your workout. So if you're working out more than 45 minutes, not not needed. You want to just change how you train weekdays. So sit training is at zone five down to zone one. That's going to help us improve the fast twitch muscle fibers and the top end metabolic anaerobic capacity that VO2 max we're improving. So anaerobic capacity to improve the ability to pulling more glucose into the cell without using insulin. I'm repeating myself again, but just over and over again, get us, get this into our heads. Zone five, we talk about improving your VO2 max, and that's what you'll hear Peter or Tia talk about, zone two and zone five. But for females, I'm, I'm trying to clear this all up because what everyone's saying to improve longevity is not all one size fits all. We need to, yes, test our VO2 max, but how we improve our longevity is going to be different for men versus women, maybe, is what I'm taking that as, as we are midlife. 
We don't need to do all zone two workouts. Five days a week, you're doing zone two, switch that, doing your intervals, say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Monday, Tuesday, you're doing intervals, rest on Wednesday, and then maybe you're doing intervals Thursday, maybe easy Friday, and then do long zone two with some intervals at the finish on your bike, Saturday, Sunday, and then one day you're doing a long run or if you're doing triathlon training. So sit training also helps shuttle glucose carbs. I talk, talk about that via insulin, but now what we want to talk about is not using insulin to shuttle glucose into the cells, but you'll hear the word glute four. They're kind of the gates to work to pull in glucose into the muscle cell. So we're opening up those gates from the glute four, the, the transporters opening up. So they're pulling the glucose in. So that's why we can work out once we get exercising, we can draw in that glucose. Now, when we are doing sprint interval training, it's more ATP, CP system, fuel source for the sprints. Glycolysis is after using your creatine phosphate fuel source. So when we start to do more HIT training, those fuel sources coming from glycolysis. And that's the next step in breaking down glucose in the cell to provide the fuel that we need to go hard. And we want to keep stimulating the enzymes to promote to stimulate the glucose metabolism, glycolysis, right? So we want to get the fuel to pull in so we can continue going hard, recover, refuel, reset, go again. So there's a lot of just science stuff, but I just want to go. The main point is I change, you know, the zone two, limit that to maybe two days a week and then start doing more these intervals with your heavy weights. And then maybe when you're run, maybe you're just going out for a warm up, and then you do 10, 30 second hill sprints at like I was doing Tory Pines and go up there. So changing your workout schedule is really important. I think my big takeaways I wrote here in the rest of this blog is lift heavy weights, one to six reps, three to five sets, two to four days a week, add in the hit 30 seconds to five minutes, max sit training. The sprints are 10 to 30 seconds all out. Add in jump training, plyometric, and it's going to increase your power and your speed. And as we lose the estrogen, the estradiol, the E2, we don't have that around. I didn't even know that estrogen helped us so much with their speed, power, strength, and body composition. So as we lose those hormones, we have to change how we train to make up for that loss of estrogen and progesterone. So this is the why we need to adjust how we train and stop blaming the aging process. Like, oh, my hormones are too low. Well, it doesn't just happen by taking hormone replacement. You still need to change your body composition with actually doing the work. There's no supplement, pill, lotion, hormone replacement to put the muscle on you. You actually have to go do the work as with everything else, you know, all the different supplements out there to lower blood sugar. It is actually you lifting weights. So Minimal effective dose. You should just 10, 20, 30 minutes be lifting weights and be done with it. You don't need to spend an hour in the gym. So cardio machines you can do for sprints are treadmill, bike, the salt bike, a row or machine, elliptical. You can do that. You know, add in, warm up, warm down, 10, 30 seconds all out, two minute easy. So you go hard on the two minutes. So every two minutes you go sprint 30 seconds and that rest of the 90 seconds is hard, easy. Then you go again. You can do box jumps, jump squats, as I did in between weights today, 30 seconds to a minute. Kettlebell swings, if your mechanics are good, my left side is all wanky, so that always hurts my back. And then recovery, she also talks about doing, um, I did like rope slams and I was trying stuff in the pool. So if you can't do jumps you know, in a on land, you, if you have a pool, shallow end, I was doing some tuck jumps in the pool and I was trying some speed skaters and just try to hop side to side and do different things. And it's actually good. All right. So more info on lipid uptake. You can read my blog on debbiepotts.net and then adding in those carbs so you can go hard. So we need to fuel for the exercise that we're doing. So not doing a hard workout and thinking you're going to get that top end performance if you don't have any calories on board and get this metabolism working. So it's hard to wrap our head around it that, oh, I might actually go harder if I have some strategic carbohydrates before that workout and even within the workout when I'm going longer and adding intervals. So 
Try it out. That's what Dr. Stacey Sims' research for female athletes shows, peri and postmenopausal. So we have these changes in our hormones and they start after 40 something. So we have these changes in our estrogen, progesterone levels, changes how the body stores and uses fat. So lower estrogen can lead to fat accumulation around the abdominal, but this is because of how the body uses, stores fat. So stop blaming lack of hormones and getting older and start taking action by what Stacey Sims is teaching us fat utilization during exercise. So, you know, we're not, we need some carbohydrates to use fat. So that's going to depend on the intensity duration of your exercise. The body's using fat as fuel, but we have to help it's so complicated, but the liver and the fuel we're pulling into the muscle, we're getting it with some carbohydrates first. So estrogen is shown to influence carb metabolism. Women who are looking to burn store body fat. So I don't know. There's lots of information. You can just go down so many rabbit holes and how to optimize fat uptake and use fat for fuel. But it's getting the right nutrition. It's getting interval training. It's managing stress. Chronic stress can really, as you know, I know, disrupt hormonal balance, promotes fat storage with that cortisol, excess cortisol. Stress reduction techniques as my sauna, you know, my morning walks, where I move to being in the outdoors, getting sleep, prioritizing sleep is huge. So if you're doing all this training and expecting changes in your body, but you're not prioritizing your sleep and your stress management, you know, get back to the sleep hygiene routine. So working on all this is important, enhancing insulin sensitivity, reducing insulin resistance, improve glycemic control increased muscle glucose uptake, enhanced fat utilization, the post-workout afterburn effect we used to always talk about, and time efficiency are all benefits from HIIT training and helping you on glucose homeostasis and getting your body to burn more fat. So try it out. Let me know if you have questions. If you want to work with me as a coach, I do have different packages I love for people to do some functional lab tests because if you don't know what's under the hood, it's really hard to get a personalized training program. So doing a Dutch test, a GI map, blood chemistry panel, we get what we can by doctor covered by insurance, but usually don't do the full thyroid panel and doing insulin. So we get what we can under insurance, but the rest of it's out of pocket, sadly. So you have to save some money up, invest in your health, but I tell you, it's really worth it. And I forgot to add that the, the benefits of plyometric training are really important as well for a lack of hormones. So that, you know, doing the box jumps and modifications are, are great, as I said, you know, in the pool, but all that's in this blog too. I'll put a link in the show notes to find where all my research notes are and info from Stacey Simps. But, you know, I am intolerant to wheat. I'm non-celiac gluten sensitivity issue or sensitive so there's six foods I put in here that your body might think that are gluten. So dairy, corn, millet, oats, rice, and yeast. So if you're trying to add more carbs and you're gluten sensitive as I am, you may not look for having the, the wheat products and the cross contaminants as these guys that your body, molecular mimicry, your body will think are gluten. So which is why people with thyroid issues should not do gluten, wheat, and all these products as well, because your body thinks thyroid, gluten are the same too. So really important to get a coach to work with to figure out what is best for you and get a organized plan. So I talked really long today. I didn't know where the time went by, but this is a huge topic I'm very passionate about, and hopefully you are interested as a female athlete, improving the aging process, improving your performance in life and sports. But really for me, it's looking at power, speed, strength. I know we get slower as we get older, but I don't feel like I can use that as an excuse because I've seen races with older people and they're doing amazing. So I want to be that old person still racing and doing uh, best time. So let's stop, pause, reset, and adjust what we're doing. All right, experiment. It's an N equals one journey. So keep it up and reach out, debbiepotts.net. If you have questions or a low-carb athlete at iCloud. 
Hey, my fellow aging endurance athletes, just a reminder, if you like what you listen to today, make sure to share this episode with your community. Head to debbiepotts.net to set up a free discovery call to learn more about my personalized coaching programs, especially if you are on a mission as myself to improve the aging process and start training to be my best self when I am 80, 90 years old. So I am on a mission to live my best life and be my best self the second half of my life. So if you're on the same mission as me, head over to my website and YouTube channel to learn more ways to improve the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Thanks for listening to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at DebbiePotts.net. You can help us continue and grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and see you next time.